What's up with it, y'all? EJ, y'all, E Business. Welcome to the channel. If this is your first time here, thank you for coming. I hope you enjoy my reaction. So, as you see, what we are about to get into right now is a documentary about Cape Town. Yes, this video is going to be long. It would be great if you watch it all. So, you know, I guess put 30 minutes to the side and just watch this all with me. That would be fantastic. If you can, then down. That means I made this hella long for no reason. But I guess it is for a reason because, hey, I'm watching this. So it's on Cape Town. It's uh, a documentary. I saw one on Joe Berg not too long ago. So people from Cape Town, they wanted me to do one on Cape Town. This was hard to find something about it because I put in um, stuff for Cape Town and everything that came up was basically negative about gangs, how to survive in Cape Town, um, how not to get robbed, then like, oh, how to live luxurious, like, you know, it's talking all that. So I just found this, it's called Behind the Beauty Cape Town, mini documentary, uh, documentary, all right, but we're about to watch this right now. I um, I didn't think I should go to anything like about travels, you know, because I guess, you know, that's kind of, yeah. But anyways, look, I'm going to watch this right now, okay, um, behind the beauty of Cape Town. So hopefully they're showing me the real with it, okay, because I do not want to do anything for traveling to learn about Cape Town because I guarantee the people from Cape Town or anybody would not want me to learn about this city like that with the traveling. Let's go though, all right? Behind the Beauty Cape Town mini documentary. I'ma try not to talk a lot because I see how long this video is though, all right? Let's get it. South Africa, probably one of the most beautiful and interesting countries in the world. But beyond all this beauty, there is another side. One of the highest crime rates in the world murders based on racism, people talking about a revolution, and these are just some of the problems the country is facing at the moment. In March 2019, we visited Cape Town and talked to people from all walks of life to find out what it's like to live in a place that the World Bank calls the most unequal city in the world. So I guess I'm about to see the real about Cape Town. So I'm sure this the is first person we I'm not watching any bullshit. ...in a cafe where he was working. Simba introduced us to his friend Mazik Sole. Like Simba, he wants economic justice. Mazik Sole told us about Karabo, who is his biggest political opponent at university. She is the youngest member of the Democratic Alliance, which is a liberal party that stands for an open opportunity society for all. During our stay we had the chance to be hosted by Nick. He works in the IT sector, but was born and raised on a farm. Nick introduced us to his boss Ihsan. He fully experienced apartheid as a colored person. Then we met a couple, Jess and Rob. Both strongly believe in the strength and goodness of the South African people. The next person we met was Patricia. Patricia comes from a family which always actively fought against apartheid. On our very last day, we had the chance to meet Tom. He works and lives in a township called... Alright, you guys. I think this is cool that I'm watching this about Cape Town because as of right now, I see it's about to be the real. I'm not going to be watching anything just showing just a luxurious area of Cape Town. So I think this is cool that I'm about to watch this and I hope that if any of you guys never seen this i hope you guys enjoy it and you guys come along with the ride with me for watching this called langa it's one of the most progressive townships around cape town all those different people gave us a better understanding of the deep unsettled issues that south africa faces and here is how it all started The idea of a new South Africa where all South Africans are equal 
The old South African flag, there still wasn't a black face to be seen. But now it really is this rainbow nation. The rainbow nation was an attempt to harmonize the differences or the antagonistic relationships that existed to try and heal the wounds of the past. But he failed. You think for the good On and... On our way to Cape Town, we saw endless townships. Doesn't happen. During the apartheid, far away from the city... ...ships were built for non-whites only. Today, instead of getting less, they are growing constantly all over South Africa. That looks nice. I think the Rainbow Nation was a, a fairy tale. It was a, a great idea, but not achievable. It failed because the attempt to it was a cosmetic change. You know, when you put on makeup, but deep down in your soul, there's an ugly, you know, the presence of yourself. South Africa then tried to put on the makeup of our past which in ways doesn't really resolve the fundamental problem of the past, which is conquest, which is land theft, which is cultural assimilation. Historically, blacks have always been the subjects. We were subjugated. We were the ones who were suffering under the laws of colonialism or apartheid, you know, we were the slaves and the other people, the other side, the whites, the Africaners, and before that the British, were the masters. The nation still functions that way, you know. We need to have a base through which they can build themselves. And I don't think the blacks here have that. Before apartheid, after apartheid, through apartheid, I don't think that we ever had that kind of power. And that's... I would have never thought it was like that over there. When I heard about the apartheid, I never heard of it before until Trevor Noah talked about it and it was just something new I learned and it tripped me out especially um, with how he was talking about the um, how people treat people that are colored and okay never mind I'm all right let's go back that's why in the past years many black South Africans started claiming and even taking land from white landowners we want our land back, we want our minerals back because everything else that comes with the land belongs to us. The, the land question in South Africa is one of the most central questions. I mean, it's the debate of centuries. Where does the land belong to? Who does it belong to? And when do you say, where is the time cut? Tribes from upcountry from the Congo Basin, they have traveled in over 1,000, 5,000 years ago and they settled like Koza and Zulu and all these different tribes coming into South Africa. You cannot landmark a time where this has belonged to someone. How, where do you draw the line? Over 100 years of fighting up until the Africans were defeated by Europeans. What Europeans did to us was an unprovoked war. There was no provocation. We didn't do anything. We never went to Europe and take some of their stuff. Once you take people's land, you take their ability to recreate their own selves. Seeing stuff like that, how, um, what he was talking about, how the Europeans came and, you know, just took the people, you know, as slaves. Me! I thought it only happened with the Europeans coming to get people from Africa, bringing us to America. I didn't even think about that, like people coming from, uh, people bringing people from Africa to Europe. This was when I was younger because we were taught that we, we came, we brought Africans to America. So I did not know that, oh yeah, they went to different continents. Never knew that until I got older. There's an actual need for people to have land because they don't have it. 
we are so easily controlled because we have no power, we have no property. They just, they just took it. They assumed that it was theirs, right? They have this belief that we took it from them and we are saying, no, we didn't. Territory must be given back to its rightful owners. Everyone claims it's his land, yeah? Can you say so? So it's not really easy to say who actually has the right to claim land, but it is definitely easy to say that there needs to be something done against the inequalities. We have had political freedom, we can vote now, we can walk around now, we can drink together, but there wasn't really much of a wealth transfer. Black people control more of the wealth in South Africa than whites. It's a very, very big misconception that white people are richer than black people. It's changed greatly over the last 20 years. There's a very, very big black middle class that is raised in South Africa. And there's a lot of very, very rich black people that made a lot of money out of the whole political transition in South Africa. I think there's three million white people left in South Africa. In general, I think they live better lives, which is an advantage that coming, coming from um, the apartheid years. But it's only three million of them, where there's 52 million blacks. We live in two different worlds at the same time. The white world and the black world. There's Europe and there's Africa. When you come towards the city, you see Europe. Big buildings, the streets are clean, people are in jovial mood. When you go to the other side, people are congested into small places, people are dying of disease, blacks are killing each other, you know, over crime and gangs. All right, so here, um, when I was, I was, I was watching a documentary, um, T.I., T.I., he went over to Cape Town and it showed like the buildings that um, people live in. That caught me off guard. I would have never thought that. Because what you hear about Cape Town is like, oh, it's a beautiful, magical city. Da -da -da -da. You know, so like how much people talk about stuff like that. You don't really think about the bad side. And how I saw that, like how it was, like the poor areas, I hate saying poor, but that caught me off guard. I just didn't think um, that people live in, I don't know what kind of buildings people call them. I, I, I never would have thought that at all. I would have never thought that. I saw that, that just caught me off guard. If you are in a white skin, you get to enjoy the privileges of life. You are living. You are ambitious, you are adventurous, you travel all over the world, make documentaries, tell, touch on people's stories. If Just you are like black, over here. It's a constant mode of survival. Just like over who here. Who lives in town, who does not live in town? Who is a cleaner, who is not a cleaner? All of the downgrading, dehumanizing, humiliating jobs and services are all designated to a particular group in society, while in relation, a group of a minority gets to enjoy all privileges. This is the type of setup that South Africa constantly deals with. Surely we should be angry and hate those who have created that particular atmosphere. We quickly realized that the big inequalities are leading to a lot of anger and hate. But we also learned that those are not the only reasons for these increasing emotions. We live in a society where the media and government are constantly pushing propaganda cards that seek to dis inform people and not give them the truth. The most propaganda that we have in South Africa is that we are where we are right now because of white people. That we are where we are right now because the apartheid has stripped us 
naked and we can never refind ourselves for as long as white people exist in the country, which is the most ridiculous thing that a person could say. There's a lot of people out there that have a blind hatred of white people. They, they absolutely look at each and every white person and just hate them and just blame them for everything that's wrong in their lives. How is hate going to fix it? What creates the possibilities for black people to hate white people? Or what creates the possibilities of white people to be scared of black people? The big gated houses with security so tight so that they can raise their children in a nice dignified way while us we raise our children in chaos. They are taught how to be and how to exist by the streets. My mother was a domestic worker who every Monday she has to go and come back on Friday. The whole week I'm not with her. Who then raises this child? The big differences in society don't only lead to hate, but also to racism. During our trip, we heard endless stories about racial discrimination. There's a tendency to feel like maybe you don't belong, or that maybe there's something inherently wrong with being black, and that's why we suffer. There was always racism, it never ever stopped. There will always be racism. There's no hiding that. You have people who walk into job spaces and because they're black they can't have jobs. In the past, if you were not white, it would be very difficult to get the job. Now when you apply for the job, and a lot of uh, people that I know that have applied for work are told that, well, we're actually looking for black people. Being a colored person, you know, I wasn't white enough during apartheid and now I'm not black enough in post-apartheid. <clears throat> it's just like that over here. It's just like that over here. But one thing that they're trying to do right now that is big is they're trying to get a lot of businesses to accept more ethnic, ethnic people, that's what they call them. First, you know, so basically anybody that's black, Hispanic, uh, Middle Eastern, Asian, basically, you know, we got to start hiring more of them, start hiring more exec um, executives, more executives that are of different race. So like what he's saying and like what I'm hearing, it just, it seems like so different. Like kind of, it just kind of catches you off guard. Like for example, the white guy, how, how what, there's 3 million white people, but I think he said what, like 52 million black people. Basically, like he's outnumbered and it kind of trips you out because there's more white people over here. Obviously we're outnumbered, black people are outnumbered over here. We're outnumbered um, even with Hispanics. Over here, 13% black. 13% uh, black and I think it's 74% white is 70% at, at least, I know that. I haven't checked for a while, but the last time I checked it was. And this is crazy. Whenever I heard about this stuff with the colored people and all. Um, so we, we, we feel that kind of frustration also. I don't know. I wouldn't say we've experienced like harsh racism. Mm. Um, I think we'll we'll experience things like someone mistaking me for an Uber driver when we oh, both God. in the car. Yeah. You know, wow. because All the time. if I'm a black person and there's a white woman, if he's driving, <laughs> no. if he's driving, they think he's an Uber driver. <laughs> it's I know, I know. Oh, things like like when we go out to eat. Mm. But you know, and then oh, they'll often bring me the bill, and then they'll yeah. give just the bill because I I don't know maybe the 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 idea is I'm supposed to be bankrolling the relationship. Yeah, yeah. Hell yeah, I'll accept that. Give her the bill then, because what you think I'm broke? Then let her ass pay for it. I'll accept that. <laughs> Because she's white, she probably yeah. has more money, and therefore, you know, yeah. she will pay for the bill. I I firmly believe. I'm that just playing. 
don't take that serious. You better not take it serious. If you watching this, you're like, what the fuck, man? Why is he saying that? No, I was just playing, all right? That a black person, especially in a South African context, mm -hmm. can be racist because racism comes with a certain level of power. Um, and throughout our history, black people have never had any sort of power. I feel black people feel that we are more racist. Um, I had a conversation with a black guy in a uh, coffee shop the other day and he literally told me to go back um, to wherever I'm from and I mean I am from South Africa where, where do I go back <laughs> I start talking to a black person he immediately puts up a wall I put up a wall because I don't want to be accused of things and he feels like I did things and everybody's just hung up what happened in the past and we're not talking about the future I think South Africa is a very long history and that history is still affecting South Africa now the fact that I mean like majority of people are still poor and live in the townships that is the legacy of apartheid so there's definitely a way more work that needs to be done before we can even get to like addressing issues of race so i don't think the problem necessarily is the racial divide the racial divide is a convenient tool for people to point at because it's convenient for me to say it's because of racism and because of white people that you're where you are right now instead of actually being frank to say that the state has failed us the state has been corrupt the state has been incapacitated the state the state has been selfish and as a result we're where we are There's no shying away that you have people who are rich within the country, you have a middle class and you have the poor. And those who are rich and a middle class have greater access because of affordability to education. Those who are poor are left outside of the system and have no access and they remain poor at the end of the day as a result. We have to fix, fix education. Um, and the whole world has gone into a manufacturing economy and we are still stuck with people that can't read and write. You have a government administration that has had an opportunity to reform and redress society. You had an opportunity for our educational system to transform itself, to ensure that you have the same access of, of quality education, but have failed to do so. The state has been so corrupt. There's just like a backlog of problems um, that are also yeah. very, very pressing and need to be addressed. On the outside, it all looks still great because you see the cars driving, you see we've still, still got electricity and water, but it's quite questionable how, for how long, for five years, the maintenance on the power plants of electricity hasn't been done. That means if they break apart now, our electricity will be gone in no time. Wow. During our time in Cape Town, South Africa cut off electricity on certain lines every day to prevent a national blackout, so everyone always had to check when exactly and for how long the power would go off at their place. And it, if we can feel it at our level as a middle class, how must it be for the life of, of, of the people living in the townships? And this is the majority of South Africans. I think with South Africa where we are, people are quite tired of empty promises, especially when it comes to politics. People never got what they were promised. The basic, the fundamentals, the basics of housing and sanitation, jobs, employment. They never really fulfilled those promises. If you're not getting what you need, people feel they need to strike, they need to damage property, they need to be heard and they need attention. People are demanding things now. They're saying, you are, you are a party and you should deliver to the things that you said you're gonna deliver and we know that I hope a lot of people are still watching I know this isn't a music reaction or anything like that but this will be dope if you guys are still watching for real please I hope some people are still watching I'm gonna take anything less than that and that's what you're seeing today with um, this generation of the born freeze people that were born after apartheid that generation is now a generation of frustrated people. This is anger, a deep, deep seated anger. That's why there's a rise in those fringe political extremist parties because people are trying to 
voice out that frustration and they really desperately needing something to change and they even willing to support parties like the EFF to mm. bring the change and that to me is the worry and the economic freedom fighters as a far left political party have their own ways to solve the problems black people all of us we need to unite and amend the constitution so that we can expropriate land without compensation so the expropriation of land without compensation is the most important call that has come out from black people so i i think i think it's needed because i know that there are some people who will not give up land and it's not being used which i think is horrific i mean you've worked for your house you've worked for your car or your whatever but you cannot just take people's things people of south africa where you see a beautiful land take it it belongs to you <laughs> the better solution will be is you get a farmer that wants to retire and you pay him for his land for his land and you keep him in an advisory position on the farm it's one thing to give people land but if they don't know what to do with it then it's it's wasted besides the sharing of land there should be the sharing of knowledge and skills because that's the only way you actually get to create a society that can sustain itself it will also help if the government stops stealing money in corruption because then there will be money for expropriation with compensation and we should get more black land owners but the current process is not let us go to war let us arm ourselves now we are ready for war so if they if they go on a mass expropriation without compensation the total the, the econ economy will collide some people i'm sure will flee but there's a lot of people in south africa that will put up a fight if things are going the way they are there will be a revolution in this country i can tell you now so there is a white minority in this country well aware about this possibility and they have got plans in place if blacks take their land they would come back they will not stand silently i can promise you that we've learned from other african countries and you know places like zimbabwe you know you can clearly see what has happened occupiers went to the farms they told the people you have 4 hours to pack up their stuff and if you don't then we will just kill you and uh, yeah so these people packed up their stuff whatever they could in 4 hours and left well if that happens what would it mean for south africa so everyone just has to it will mean it will mean civil war damn definitely wow we are aware enough that we don't want that for south africa i think people do want change but it's never going to go to a point where by there's like civil war or anything like that obviously it's not something we want to happen but it's something that we have to keep in mind in any future plans that we make Although many people were always talking about a revolution, everyone was still very positive about future hopes and solutions. I still believe that there is hope for a time where we can racially be a South Africa for all. In a divided South Africa where white people hate black people and black people hate white people, there is no solution. Man, he feels the pain right there. I could tell you that he feels the pain. He feels all alone. Hey, what being white out there? Man, he feel all alone. He got me scared for his ass. Man, he must be yeah. He must be scared of black people. I think he probably wanted them. He might be scared of black people. For real, I'm being dead serious. Might not be, but just like how he's talking and just some of the things. Nah, I think he's scared of black people. That's real talk. Hopefully I'm wrong, but Nah, it feels like, you know, he could be. We, we need to change it's our mindset because politics is our life. So whether you're black or you're white, the decisions are taken politically. So you needed to be 
well more educated politically. And for as long as we as civilians do not educate ourselves and are misinformed, we're giving in power to the state and the media to dictate to us what the truth is. Because the summer crisis is not only for those who are in power, but it's for us. Only when we can sit around the table and say, okay, this is what, what I want and this is what you want and this is what's the best for the country. Everyone that is hoping for the country to change, unemployment rate, quality health, education, those, those are three basic things. Get people when employed so they can be busy, they can be productive. And then get people educated, they can be independent. And then you give proper, proper health, then people can be healthy. So. Working together, creating jobs, uh, creating opportunities, this is how we uplift all these people that don't have houses and don't have jobs, not by fighting each other. When we sit down and compromise, we're going to be okay. We need to get a government that will work for the people and sees everybody as the people, not just one particular segment. And we need to stop this corruption that we have in our, in our country. Beyond that, we need to have a state that reprioritizes and capacitates the police system that works within South Africa because we have a crime crime rates that are ridiculous. So these are but a few things that can contribute towards having a functioning state. And when a state is functioning, when people have basic access to, to, to services, then people have quality life. When people have quality life, people are happy. When people are happy, people are peaceful at the end of the day. And that's all that we need. As much as we all have our differences, we're still a part of a community. If there's a cause, and if there's something that needs to be done, people let me know if you guys like this for the people that are still watching this let me know if you guys um watched it like this that i'm doing this and just let me know let me know if you feel i should be doing something else on cape town all right i think this is cool because i guess I'm, I'm seeing the real of it right now all right really unite and they and they and they do it we need time to to understand ourselves and to know who we are we're getting there we still a, we are a developing country. I think the South Africans are the most exciting and, and inspiring people on this planet. And I think um, this is still the best place to live. Um, it's exciting and I'm really glad that my children grew up here and had the chance to be thrown into that diversity. What I like about Cape Town is what I don't like about Cape Town. I remember the first time I saw Kemp's Bay and I was, what, 10 years old? Coming from a small town like Mtata, where everyone's got a very standard way of living and then coming to Cape Town and then my cousin took me to Camps Bay and standing in Camps Bay and looking at this world that I've never seen before it, it, it felt like I was in another country it, you know it yeah. felt like I was in another place and I kind of felt two things while I was standing there this 10 year old boy watching Camps Bay there was this sense of the world is so much more bigger and and you know if you really if you really work hard enough you can get access to that but there was also this like very deep sadness of why am i growing up in a place that is so different from this like why do i have to come up from a world where people are struggling yet there's a world where people are just freaking chilling um sitting in balconies enjoying the sun with the beach right next to them it gives you that sense of aspiration. He's <laughs> a beach right next to him. I only thought he said a bitch right next to me. <laughs> a bitch right next to me. Knowing that the world can offer way more, but at the same time, it depresses me a little bit because it's like, it makes it so clear the divide between those who have and those who don't. That makes me want to go out to Cape Town even more. Let me know how you guys feel about it. People from Cape Town, just well, people all around the world. But I have people from Cape Town that wanted me to do this. Let me know if you'll like me to do something else about your place where you live. So let me know if you just want me to find like the luxuries of being in Cape Town. Let me know though. All right, go ahead, like the video, subscribe to my channel, y'all. Thanks for coming.